Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want us to think for a moment. What's the oldest thing that you own? Not the oldest thing that you know. Don't go pointing fingers to anyone. The oldest thing that you own. Right? Maybe it's a family heirloom, something that's been passed down, a, a watch or a piece of jewelry, a great-great-grandma's silverware that's actually made out of silver instead of whatever we make ours out of today. Right? Something passed down, the oldest thing you own. Maybe it's a classic car that you have in the garage that at some point you're going to restore but in the meantime, it's sitting out there looking like it's the oldest thing that you own. And there's any number of, of things that uh, we think are old. Maybe it's uh, a t-shirt from high school, from that championship that you won, that one day you're going to wear it again, but in the meantime, it's collecting dust in, in a bin somewhere. But you can't get rid of it because those were the glory days. Do any of you have the oldest thing that you own? Is it in your pantry? I think in, in your, your pantry. I, I was thinking about this, and this isn't the oldest thing I own, but uh, anyone remember this? This guy is, uh, this is a Big Mac. This is a box of Wheaties from 1999. Uh, now, I, I uh, got this about 10 years ago for 25 cents at a garage sale, which is a steal, let me tell you. And the person, though, had wisely, uh, they had taken the cereal out of the box here. Uh, because after 20 years, is this still the breakfast of champions? I don't think so. See, we don't find the oldest thing that we own in the pantry because there's a thing called an expiration date. Now, for some of you, uh, that's just a guideline. I, so for you know, with milk, I don't do that at all. Like if, if it's the next day, the day pet doesn't matter. The entire thing goes. I don't play that game. Uh, but but some of you, it's more like a guideline, or it's like the nutritional facts. It's printed on the box for someone else, but not for me to read. Uh, but by and large, I mean the reason the expiration date is there is it's a warning. Warning: this will not last forever. It keeps us safe when it comes to our food. We, we actually need expiration dates. We need something to tell us this is not going to last forever. But it's actually more important, not, not with, with food, but with life in general, especially when things are really hard. We want some sort of a sign, a, a guarantee that this is not going to last forever. That's why when you get surgery, one of the questions that you always ask is, what's the recovery time? Because what you want to know is, all right, coming after surgery, there's going to be some pain, but I want to know, when is that pain going to end? Is it six weeks? All right, then if the doctor says your recovery time is six weeks, as you get out of the operating room, as you go through those first couple days, and the pain is intense, you keep that number in your mind, six weeks, and you count down five weeks, four weeks, because you know the pain ultimately has an end. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. This isn't going to last forever. So we need expiration dates. But the problem is, it seems like there's so much in our life that doesn't have it. There's so many things that don't seem to have an end. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Our financial situation seems to be something we can't climb out of. A conflict that's never going to end. A sin that we can't help but going back to. We can't forget no matter how hard we try. Grief that is constantly present with us. There's any number of things that we look and we think, is this ever going to end? See, when the diagnosis isn't, there's a six-week recovery time, it's this is something you're going to live with. Whether it's, it's a physical problem, whether it's a mental health 
issue. It's, this is something that's just going to be a part of your life. And in those moments, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. There's no expiration date, and it's easy to lose heart. It's easy to turn to despair. It's easy to lose hope. And it's to people who can't see light at the end of the tunnel, who all they see is their suffering, their pain, oppression. It's to those people the prophet Nahum comes. See, God's people for generations have experienced oppression at the hands of the Assyrian Empire. I mean, the Syrians were powerful. They were ruthless. They conquered any and all in their path. We we may recognize Assyria a little bit from the city of Nineveh, their great city. Uh, We know that that's where Jonah was sent. And that's where Jonah didn't want to go because they're the enemy. They're the worst. They are the ones who have oppressed not just Israel, but the entire world. Who would want to go there? They're evil. So Jonah goes the other way. And even when he goes back to Nineveh, he preaches, they repent. What does Jonah do in response? He's angry at God. He's angry at God for being so good, he can even cause repentance in the most evil of people. See, and from the time to Jonah to the time of Nahum, generations have passed, and there is no longer the fruits of repentance in the city of Nineveh. All there is is evil and oppression. And that's carried out across the world. See, right before this is, is written, the great nation of Egypt, just south of Israel, has been obliterated by the Assyrians. Their city, capital city of Thebes, one of the great cities of the ancient world, is decimated. A couple decades before that, the northern kingdom of Israel was totally wiped out by the Assyrians, taken off into exile. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom scattered for all time. And the kingdom of Judah, this holy city of Jerusalem, God's chosen people are surrounded by a nation that is not just more powerful than them, but more powerful than everyone. There is no end in sight to the Assyrian empire. There's no power that can challenge them. There's no one that can match them. And so all they see is evil and oppression, persecution, and ultimately exile and slavery. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no end to the story. There is no happy resolution. And everyone in the entire world knows it. Except Nahum. Because he is a prophet of the Lord. And when in our pain, our suffering, all we can see is that moment, all we can feel is that feeling. God sees a much larger picture, a much larger story. And so for, for three short chapters, the prophet Nahum, against all odds, against any evidence of the power of the world, Nahum prophesies, guarantees the downfall of the Assyrian Empire. The great city of Nineveh, Nineveh, their power is coming to an end. He doesn't say when it's going to happen. He doesn't, frankly, say how it's going to happen. What he says is that the Lord will make it happen. That God has turned his face against Nineveh, against the Assyrians. See, almost the entirety of Nahum is actually written to Nineveh. It's one of the few books in the entire Bible where God's people are rarely addressed by name. What they're invited to do is to listen in on what God is saying to the Assyrians, to their enemies. What God is saying to evil and to oppression. What God is saying is that your time will come to an end. There is an expiration date on the Assyrian Empire. Which means there is an expiration date on evil, on oppression, on injustice. God's people are meant to listen in on this prophecy. 
and not to try to figure out when that is going to happen. Because for most of them, that will not happen in their lifetime. But to have hope that one day it will come. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And more than that, they have the light of the world. Their God who is with them. He is their refuge and their strength. See, when we can't see an end to the pain, to the suffering, to the injustice that we are experiencing. We are called to see that the light of the world Jesus Christ has come to this world. As Nahum proclaims, there is someone who will come that will proclaim and deliver peace. The angels declare at Christmas that he will be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That light of the world is with us in the midst of the darkness of our suffering. But also that light of the world is coming back. When he comes back, he will bring an end to that which is not meant to last. That's where we find our hope. That's what we look forward to. So to kind of visualize this, this is one of my uh, oldest and kind of favorite illustrations uh, that I've used. And I haven't come up with anything better uh, over over the years. Uh, So here we go. This is a rope. Uh, and uh, this rope represents uh, your life. And, and oftentimes we think, as we're, as we're stuck in our pain, we think our, that this pain, this injustice, this guilt, this is just going to last forever. We can't see the end, and so our entire story becomes defined by whatever it is that we're suffering from, whether it's grief, whether it's financial issues, whether it's a job we can't seem to get out of, whether it's conflict justice, oppression, that becomes our entire story. And we get overwhelmed. We, we lose hope. But what God invites us to do is to see that our, our story, if this is our life, our time here on earth is not all of this. The time here on earth is this. This little blue section on the end This is your time on earth, and this is eternity somewhere else. That is your life. And through Jesus Christ, we know what this is. We know that that heaven and called home, that the new creation, when Christ comes back and makes all things new, this is the end of your story. This is by far the greater chapters of your story. We have chapter one and then chapter two through six billion and counting is here. And when we know the rest of that story, it changes how we experience this first chapter here on earth. Because we we look at the prologue and we see that God has already won the victory for you. God has already claimed you. See, knowing what God has done for us allows us to walk through the suffering, the pain, the troubles of this part, and knowing that it has an end. See, we we experience injustice, whether it's oppression like the Israelites faced through the Assyrian Empire, or whether it's it's the injustice, the, the violence racism, all the effects of sin that we see in our our country, in our world, even in our homes. Just like the Assyrian Empire, that has an expiration date. The Assyrians were not going to reign forever. Their empire was going to end. It's the same thing with all evil in this world. You see, there is no evil in eternity. In the new creation, there is no oppression, there is no violence, there is no war. Because that all has an end date, has an expiration date. The reign of God does not. As we think about financial difficulties, we worry about the economy, we worry about our own job situation, whatever it is. We know that all of that has an expiration date. Your money does not 
go with you here because you don't need it here. God has given it to you for, for this time and for a purpose to invest it eternally, to make a difference for an eternity with something that is temporary. That's why God's people in the Old Testament are called uh, to tithe 10%, to invest in something eternal. God's people in the New Testament are called to generosity, to think is, is above and beyond, to take all that God has given us to invest it eternally to something that actually matters because at the end of the day money doesn't last which means money problems don't last stress finances won't last has an expiration date i mean even look at what happened with cryptocurrency the last couple weeks that isn't even going to last in our lifetime uh, much as anything else that we have that we build is for this time and so we're called to freely invest, to give that for something that matters, the kingdom of God. Your sin has an expiration date. See, oftentimes when we think sin has a date on it, yeah, it has a date. It's when I, when I committed it or, or when it first started and how long it's continued or when the sin happened to me. Yeah, that's the date. I can't forget it. I can't get it out of my head. I keep going back to it again and again and again. That's not the date that's on your sin. The date is in the shape of the cross of Jesus Christ where he carried that sin for you, where from the cross he said, Father, forgive them, including you. They know not what they do. And when he died, he breathed his last. That forgiveness was one for you. So your sin also has another date on it. For me, it's July 7th, 1991. It was the date that I was baptized. See, in the waters of baptism, that is the expiration date for your sins. They are washed away to the water and the word, the promise of Jesus Christ that you are in his family. See, it's not just that your sin doesn't exist here, is that your sin has been forgiven here. You don't need to carry it with you anymore. Sin is expired. God's forgiveness is not. Even death itself has an expiration date. I mean, death is, is, is the problem that seems to expire everything else, and yet death itself is not final. The grave couldn't hold Jesus, so the grave can't hold you. See, this is why your life is not, on earth is not the whole story. Your life is this, because when Christ raises you from the dead, eternity in heaven with him in the new creation becomes your story. And what that means for us when we live with grief, with loss, is it gives us, per, up, us a perspective that yes, we, we miss, we mourn, we grieve those who we've lost. We are missing them in this time. But think about all the time in the world to come. When Christ raises all who believe, all that time that we still have to look forward to, that gives us hope in the midst of death, that death does not win. See, as we celebrate Christ the King Sunday, the, the last Sunday of the church, we look forward to Christ's return, Him making all things new. Look forward to that new creation. And what that's meant to do is to give us hope today. To give us comfort in the midst of whatever it is that you can't see the end of the tunnel. To know that in the new creation, that will be gone. See, the injustice and oppression, evil, has an expiration date. The kingdom of God does not. See, money, finances, troubles have an expiration date. Contentment in Christ does not. Your sin 
has an expiration date. God's grace does not. Worry, pain, despair have an expiration date. God's peace does not. Death has an expiration date. Eternal life does not. This world has an expiration date, but Jesus does not. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until he calls you home. At this time, we continue with our hymn.